On behalf of our parish family, we welcome you to St. Benedict Catholic Church. To all our visitors, we extend a special welcome. Today we celebrate the third Sunday of Easter. Readings can be found at number 905, 905. This Mass is being offered for Claire Ludwizak. Our second collection this weekend is for Archdiocesan Seminarians. Today's celebrant is Father Ben, and he will be assisted by Deacon Jerry. Please check to make sure all cell phones are turned off at this time. Please join us in our processional hymn, Glory in the Cross, number 375, the Easter verse, verse number 8, number 375. <laughs> Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. Lord Jesus, you raise us to new life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You forgive us our sins. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You feed us with your body and your blood, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
Let us pray. May your people exult forever, O God, in renewed youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, we may, we may look forward in confident hope to the rejoicing of the day of the resurrection. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter said to the people, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence when he had decided to release him. You denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. The author of life you put to death, but God raised him from the dead. Of this we are witnesses. Now I know, brothers, that you acted out of ignorance, just as your leaders did. But God has thus brought to fulfillment what he had announced beforehand, through the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be wiped away. The word of the Lord. reading from the first letter of St. John. My children, I am writing this to you so that you may not commit sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is expiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for those of the whole world. The way we may be sure that we know him is to keep his commandments. Those who say, I know him, but do not keep his commandments, are liars, and the truth is not in them. But whoever keeps his word, the love of God is truly perfected in him. 
the word of the Lord. you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The two disciples recounted what had taken place on the way and how Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. While they were still speaking about this, he stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Then he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do questions arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you can see. I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, he asked them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. He said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and Psalms will be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Black and white, we don't like the gray so much. Humanity doesn't do well with nuance and complexities. We want a clear answer. And well, we should, because the deep desire of the human heart is to know truth, to know the black and the white. And truth with a capital T, God, is both simple and clear and there is no shadow of change in him. However, creation is something else, and the world and all creatures in it, including ourselves, have a great deal of complexity and a great deal of nuance. And although there is always a right answer to something, it's almost never clear of whether we've gotten to it or not. The tendency and the temptation of humanity is going to be to take extremes so we can settle this tension with our hearts and the things that we see before us and come artificially to a black and white answer and not deal 
so much with the gray. We tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater and reduce things to simplicity where there is no simplicity with that good desire to seek truth itself. One of the areas where we tend to artificially simplify is when it comes to us and what we are, especially body and soul. On the one hand, we might like to say, well, we're just a body, and the mind is just a product of the firing of the brain. Or on the other side, we might say, well, we're just a soul, and this thing is just an accessory, a meat machine that we pilot. But the church is irritatingly more complex. We are body and soul. Our identity is found not just in one of them, but in both. We cannot simply say that we are just a clump of cells, nor can we say we are just a ghost in the machine, but rather our identity is both. We are body and we are soul. In the gospel today, we hear that the disciples, not thinking correctly, presume that Christ is a ghost. They presume that the body isn't really there. And so Christ corrects them very earthily and very physically, showing him, them his physicality, showing them that they can eat and that he indeed still bears the wounds and can be touched like a physical thing. He shows, in short, that the resurrection isn't about just the spirit departing and continuing to live but the actual reformation of the body itself, spiritual cell by spiritual cell. Indeed, we hear at the very beginning of the gospel that the apostles who came, or the disciples who came and told the apostles, we've seen the risen Christ, they understood who he was in what? Specifically, the breaking of the bread, because that is indeed his true flesh. And he comes to show us that the resurrection is indeed in the flesh as well. Now, this idea of the resurrection of the body is something that perhaps we as Catholics, if you're a Catholic attending Mass on Sunday, surely you know our identity is in our immortal souls for one. But sometimes we need to be reminded that our identity is also actually in our body that we really are bodies. This isn't just clothing that our soul wears. And when the DDF, the doctrinal office of the church, just recently in the past few days, uh, issued a letter on the dignity of humanity, this fundamentally talks, therefore, about the dignity of the body, because the body is sacred since human beings are in Christ. Now think about that for a second, that the body is sacred. We can step aside from that and very easily be tempted to not see that, because although we can understand that the soul has been corrupted in some way, the soul itself isn't physically before our face every day. Our bodies are. And so we might think to ourselves, well, the human body goes through various stages of development from the womb to death, and during that process it goes through a lot of changes. How can something so malleable be sacred? Or we see diseases or being born with defects or acquiring physical defects throughout the course of our life, and we say, how could something like that be sacred? The reality is both the development and the fact of corruption actually rationally speak to the dignity underlying those things. You cannot talk about change and development of something unless there is the thing that it is that is changing. If each step of difference is something else entirely, then something didn't change, you just have a new thing at each given moment. But the fact that we talk about the human species and really any biological species starting and ending means that there is this dignity, a theme that's actually there that's undergoing change. 
So the fact that we speak about the biological human species tells us that humanity is there at every single stage. Likewise, believe it or not, corruption and defect actually speak to the dignity of the thing. If the corruption was what it was, if you are the corruption, then it's not corruption at all. It's simply what you are. Corruption exists like a parasite on the reality of what we are. To say that we have a disease is not to claim that we are the disease, but that something has been corrupted that is there. If there is no good there being corrupted, then there really is no corruption. Corruption itself and every defect, every disease that we face in life, and every withering away by age in itself to speak like that logically and not irrationally is to imply the fundamental dignity is already there with the human being. So what does that mean? What does that mean for us particularly? Well, it means a lot of things, obviously. And there's nearly two millennia of church teaching on the dignity of the human body. And even more so in the last few days, the DDF issuing the statement on the dignity of the human body addresses some of these issues that are relevant to us today. Now, if we were to talk about all the implications of the reality that we are body and soul, this would not just take one college class, but probably several college classes and even a degree on it. So we will just simplify it to uh, four different things. So the first one is that we should be concerned with the physical health of our neighbor. Now, certainly the spiritual well-being, the soul and the choices a person makes is more important than the physical. But simply because of that fact doesn't mean we as Catholic Christians can neglect the physical welfare of others. We need to be concerned with the physical well-being of our brothers and sisters, be it in health care or standards of living. Now, how you bring about this process is something definitely open to debate. But what isn't open to debate is our concern for those things. As James 2.16 tells us, if we just wish our neighbors well and do not provide for their well-being, what good is that? If you wish somebody starving on the side of the road, which you have means to help with, you wish them well and don't provide them food at all, what good is that? They and their very fundamental dignity of what they are is also physical, not just spiritual. For us, we are temples of God. Our own body is our temple. Now, Scripture states this, but the doctrine makes this very clear that this is what we are. And this church building is a sort of representation of the temple in some sense. And I think almost everybody here would recognize the absolute absurdity and indignity of turning this space, especially up here, into a party space in between masses, where people come up and relax and drink and just talk and do all sorts of partying. We can understand that absurdity, but even more than should we understand the absurdity of doing that with our own bodies. What we put into our bodies and what we use our bodies physically for matters for the spiritual life. We shouldn't engage in gluttony. We shouldn't gather to ourselves all manner of drugs and chemicals and put that into ourselves as if this is just something that we can use. Because it's fundamentally us. And since it's fundamentally us, through Christ it is a sacred temple and ought to be treated as such. Likewise, in the modern world, all sorts of different ideologies come up about the body. And since we fundamentally are this biological being, we are human and we are male and we are female. That is who we are. It's not something subject to change. And so the ideologies of transhumanism or transgenderism cannot be accepted by us. We are human, 
and we are male and female. That is who we are, not simply some accessory subject to change. And although, unfortunately, some might be subjected to the butchers on this, one of the good things which we can point out of this, because this dignity is unchangeable despite whatever corruption we do to it, that dignity remains in whatever person, no matter what they've been through in life, no matter what so-called doctors have tried to change. Although they do great physical harm to children and even spiritual harm, that dignity still remains. Now, the reality of this, since we are truly human and truly male and female, to try to alienate oneself from that is not only going to bring about physical harm in the person, but also spiritual harm. And you can see this in forms of depression for people who go down this rabbit hole, depression that even leads up to the point of spiritual despair. Likewise, because this dignity, this dignity of the body, cannot be overcome by corruption and disease, this means that no matter how we're born, whether we're born with the best of bodies or the worst of bodies, the fundamental dignity is unharmed by all these corruptions we have. It also means every stage in development of the human being is part of the biological human species and therefore contains in itself human dignity. Otherwise, we cannot say this is the human being developing. This means at the moment of conception, we are still human. It means at the very end of life, even if we've forgotten who we are, even if we are in the state of utter indignity by appearances, the human being prevails. And no matter what defect or cognitive stage that we're in, no matter how developed or undeveloped the brain is, it fundamentally is human and therefore is fundamentally sacred. So look down at yourself. Look at this thing that is indeed you. That is the temple of God where God chooses to dwell with you. Your neighbor is a sacred temple and you are a sacred temple. Treat both like that. And although we are in this land of exile where it seems like the temple has been destroyed, spiritual cell by spiritual cell, we will be rebuilt if we remain in Christ. And we will worship in the true temples of our spiritual body in everlasting happiness in the new Jerusalem. Brothers and sisters, let us profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, unsubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate for the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
Amen. Trusting in the power of the risen Christ, let us bring our needs to God today. For church leaders, may the Lord guide them in caring for the physical and spiritual needs of those they serve. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are struggling in their faith, may they be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all gathered here, may the Spirit renew us in the hope of the resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick, especially Stella Fellinger, Ilka Todorov, and Borislav, may they feel God's healing and fortifying power. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, especially Andrew Ekrot, may they rest in eternal peace with the Father in heaven. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And let us pray particularly for the repose of the soul of Claire Ludwig Zach, for whom this Mass is offered. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God of hope, receive these petitions we offer you today. We make these prayers through Christ our Lord. Please join us in singing our offertory hymn, Alleluia, Alleluia, Let the Holy Anthem Rise, number 411. Alleluia, Alleluia. <laughs> that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Receive, O Lord, we pray, these offerings of your exultant Church, and as you have given her cause for such great gladness, grant also that the gifts we bring may bear fruit in perpetual happiness through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. With Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right and just. it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but in this time above all to laud you yet more gloriously, 
when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. By the oblation of his body, he brought the sacrifices of old to fulfillment. In the reality of the cross, and by commending himself to you for our salvation, showed himself the priest, the altar, and the lamb of sacrifice. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exults in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic host sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mystery of Faith. celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with Saint Mark the Evangelist, Saint Anselm, and Saint Benedict, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence 
we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis our Pope and Gregory John our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family, whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior's command informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. have two more Eucharistic ministers, please. 
The disciples recognized the Lord Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Alleluia. Please join us in singing our communion hymn, Alleluia, Sing to Jesus, number 458, Alleluia, Sing to Jesus, 458.
Just a few announcements. Please take a bulletin as you leave. Um, volunteer uh, and camper registration for Vacation Bible School uh, is open. See parish happenings for details. So it's that time of year we're already preparing for summer and Vacation Bible School. So please um, register early. Tickets for the St. Benedict Top Golf Challenge and Fun Fest on April 21st will be sold after Mass today. Uh, this is a fundraiser for the 9-11 Memorial Section of the Colin Barron Project. Unleash your inner genius. Sign up, um, sign up your team for Father Paul's Trivia, which takes place April 27th. Again, see Parish Happenings uh, to register for that. The Knights of Columbus St. Benedict Council is celebrating 33 years of service to our parish with a dinner on May 4th, and all here are invited. Tickets are on sale in the Narthex after Mass. Online registration for the Faith Formation, um, our school of 2024-25 or next year, uh, will, will open April 22nd. It's a date to remember. And again, please take a bulletin. There's just a lot in there and a lot going on. Thank you and God bless. Let us pray. Look with kindness upon your people, O Lord, and grant, we pray, that those you were pleased to renew by eternal mysteries may attain in their flesh the incorruptible glory of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Before you leave today, please join us in the recessional hymn, number 406, Three Days, 406.